long cells. So in your quadriceps, your, your single cells can actually be that long and made up of a bunch of cells that fuse together and we call that a syncytium. And the heart cells, on the other hand, are all short and squat little cells. They're more like bricks in the wall, and each brick only has two nuclei in it, so it's a much shorter, squatter cell. And so because of these changes in cell shape, there's some thought that that may be why dystrophin mutations differentially affect the heart versus the muscle. Another important difference between heart and muscle is the kind of activity they have to do. So, for example, your skeletal muscle tends to move when you tell it to move, and that's voluntary skeletal muscle. Now, your breathing muscles are a little bit different than that because you have to breathe all the time. And then the heart muscle is a lot more like, like the muscles, which is that basically it has to go 24-7. There's no taking a break if you're a heart muscle. You've got to go all the time. The other thing is that the innervation, how the nerves talk to the muscles are also different. So our voluntary skeletal muscles, they have innervation and that responds, that's your brain talking through your nerves, telling your muscles to move. And on the other hand, your heart muscle, as I said, going 24-7, it's under very different nerve influence that can increase and decrease your heart rate, but that's about the degree that we see innervation changing. And so that's different between heart and muscle. So in Becker muscular dystrophy, by and large, there is heart involvement, although not every single patient will have it, and they will have it to varying degrees. But cardiomyopathy is the main thing that we worry about happening to the heart, and cardiomyopathy just means weakness of the heart muscle. The other thing that I personally spend a lot of time stressing about, because it's my job to prevent this from happening, is irregular heart rhythms, and those are called arrhythmias, and we'll talk a little bit about those. The arrhythmias can affect the top chamber of the heart or the bottom chamber of the heart, the ones that affect the top chamber of the heart are called atrial arrhythmias, and those um, tend to be what I call annoying rhythms, and they can have consequences, and we have to deal with it. But the ones that affect the ventricle or the main pumping chamber of the heart, those are the ones that can be life-threatening, and so we really want to prevent those from happening. Um, we talked a little bit about that the heart and skeletal muscle can be different, and one of the striking things is that the pace of disease can be very different between the heart and skeletal muscle, especially in Becker muscular dystrophy. We can have some people that the skeletal muscle is following a very different path than the heart involvement, and so that's why we really need to monitor both conditions. And the main thing about Becker muscular dystrophy, as all of you here in the room today will hopefully uh, learn from meeting and talking with each other, is it's a hugely wide range of what shows up in Becker muscular dystrophy. And so that makes it challenging to, to take care of patients and to make sure that we're doing the best we can, but also makes it challenging to do clinical trials because we're dealing with such a broad range of what we see. So I'm going to, like Lisa, I'm going to talk a little, Dr. Wolfer, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the patients and what we do for them because it makes the point about how to take care of your heart. So this is uh, one of my patients here who's a 19-year-old who carries a diagnosis of DMD slash BMD, and a number of you probably know what it's like to carry that diagnosis. So you're a little milder than a Duchenne patient, and you're probably a little more on the severe end of the spectrum for a Becker muscular dystrophy patient. So this was an individual who's now in his later 20s, and I first met him when he was 19 years old and he was in college. His muscle weakness started at the age of eight, so later than it would be normally for a Duchenne patient, and he started full-time wheelchair use around the age of 20, so again, later than that would be for a Duchenne patient. He had a stop codon mutation, and at the time I met him, he already had moderately decreased heart function. And as many of you know, the way we talk about heart function, we talk about it in terms of ejection fraction. So each time the heart beats, the heart kicks out about 60% of the blood that's inside it. So in normal ejection fractions, a 60 number, 60%. So his heart function when we first met was already drifting down into the very low 30s and the high 20s, so he had decreased heart function. We started him on an ACE inhibitor. That's really the first line medication that we use. Um, we added a beta blocker. That's the next most important medication, and we use those hand in hand, and we'll talk a little bit more about me uh, medications. He continues and actually continues on this day using prednisone. Prednisone is much more routinely used in Duchenne and much more rarely used in Becker patients. Um, and in part because we really just don't know whether prednisone use is really worth it in Becker patients because it's been hard to do that study. Um, his ejection fraction actually improved from 28% up to 44% just by adding the medications that we talked about. 
So how do we look at ejection fraction? Well, many of you have probably had echocardiograms, and this is what we do with the echocardiogram. You lay on the table, and the, this is a transducer which gets held against your heart, and there's three standard views that we basically do in the same order. We have a long axis view, we have a short axis view, and then we have the view where we look at all four chambers of the heart, and that's what we do. Um, when we look at the four-chamber view, it's pretty straightforward. You can see both the left ventricle, the main pumping chamber of the heart. The right ventricle is always a little bit harder to see, um, left atrium and right atrium. And so how does it look? Well, this is what a four-chamber view looks like. This is the left ventricle, and this is the ventricle not pumping very well, kicking out 29% of the blood volume in it, so about half the amount of normal. And when he started on medications, you can actually see that that heart is beating more vigorously and now improved to 44%. And by adding some additional medications, which I'll talk about in a second, spironolactone, we've actually brought this heart function up to close to 50%. So again, a very nice response to medications. So um, this was a paper that came out. This was mainly done in Duchenne patients, but did include some Becker patients. And this was basically demonstrating that point, that the common medications that we use for heart failure, which are ACE inhibitors or their cousin medications called angiotensin receptor blockers, along with beta blockers, can get exactly that result that I just showed you in a patient. We can take patients whose heart function is already down and actually improve it and make it a bit better. But ideally, we really want to start these medications before the heart gets bad. There's no point in letting the heart get bad. Let's, let's keep it from doing that. So that's what raised this question, which is that if you can reverse, partially reverse the left ventricular dysfunction, can you actually prevent it by starting medications early? Now, this is a trial that was actually done in France, led by Dennis Dubuc's group, where they asked that question. And they did this in Duchenne patients. And we more or less have to assume that the same thing is true for Becker patients, because the study hasn't been done in Becker patients yet. But the idea here was if we start with patients and we give them ACE inhibitor before the heart gets bad, can we slow the heart down from getting bad? So they started with 80 patients who all had Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and they were between the ages of 9 and a half and 13 with an average around 10 years of age. 20% um, or 20 of the 80 patients already had some reduced left ventricular function at the time of the study, suggesting that at least for Duchenne, they should think about doing this a little bit earlier. And at the end of the day, they had 57 patients who met criteria. Half of the patients got placebo. Half of the patients got started on perindopril, which is an ACE inhibitor. And I will say I think this works for all ACE inhibitors. I don't think it matters what ACE inhibitor you take. And then after three years, everybody got an ACE inhibitor. And then they looked at the results that they got. So if we just look, this is at the beginning. Everybody's up above this 45% line in terms of function. And the people who got perindopril early are marked here in orange. And the people who got it later are marked here in black. So if we look after the five years of the study, here's the people in orange who got the early therapy. All but one of the patients stayed above the 45% mark with their ejection fraction, whereas those who got the later therapy, you see there's this group of patients that fell below the line. So what this says is if you start medications early, you can actually prevent problems from happening. They actually followed up these patients do it 10 years after doing the study, and they found that there was also a difference in their survival rates. So not only is this just heart function, you know, some people say, well, you're just looking at numbers in the heart function. No, this actually translated to who survived better. So it showed that this was a really important idea to start medications early. So um, the next patient I want to talk to you about is actually one of my Duchenne patients. Uh, he has a deletion in dystrophin. He started using wheelchair full-time around the age of 11 to 12, had used prednisone in the past, was using his BiPAP at night. His ejection fraction was around 40%, and he was using Losartan, which is the cousin medication of, of the ACE inhibitor, the angiotensin receptor blocker, Carvedilol, which is a beta blocker, and digoxin, which is another medicine that we use for heart failure, and he developed ventricular tachycardia. Now, this brings on the discussion of when we talk about arrhythmias. Arrhythmias, when they affect the bottom chamber of the heart, can be life-threatening arrhythmias. And ventricular tachycardia is a life-threatening arrhythmia. So what do we do for that? Well, we actually can put in devices known as uh, defibrillators. So the electrical system of the heart actually starts up here in what's called the SA node, and then it travels down here lower in the heart to the AV node, and then it travels down to the main pumping chambers or the ventricles. So we're talking about rhythm disturbances that start down here. 
This is what ventricular tachycardia looks like. This actually came from his device because he did receive a defibrillator and continued to have some ventricular tachycardia. So here's the heart beating along normally, and he started to have ventricular tachycardia where the heart is beating very fast, too fast to actually fill and provide the needs of the body. And what the device does is it actually senses a period of having this ventricular tachycardia and then delivers a shock, and you see the heart responds by going right back to the normal rhythm. So this is a life-saving event, which is to actually have a defibrillator. Now, we don't give defibrillators to anybody. We only really want to put these things in when you need to have them in. And that has to do with having heart function below 35%. And then having, these days I'm using a lot of MRI to look at how much scar is in the heart. And then also if you're monitoring for your heart shows any evidence of irregular rhythms. And that's a discussion uh, many of the patients here who know me know we've talked about this a lot. So um, this is another patient who developed muscle weakness in his 20s and 30s, was diagnosed with Becker in, at the age of 39. In his 40s, he developed some cardiomyopathy and developed heart failure symptoms of shortness of breath and fatigue. Uh, was placed on an ACE inhibitor, beta blocker, and a water pill, which is known as a diuretic, was using his CPAP device at night, uh, was using a, a fancier version of a defibrillator, which actually could pace both ventricles and make things better, and we added a medicine called spironolactone, which is a medicine that we do use in heart failure. And this actually resulted in quite a bit of stability and a lot of improvement in symptoms by just adding that medication. Um, I'm going to just move ahead. Oh, this was to explain about the biventricular pacing. This was the, this individual actually had a pacer that was here, a lead placed here in the left ventricle and placed here in the right ventricle that could coordinate how the left and right ventricle will actu were actually working with each other and improve heart function a little bit. And this is what those devices actually look like when they're in place. But the medication that we added was the medication called spironolactone. And the cousin medication of that is a plerinone. And this is a medication that we now know in heart failure, if we're just talking about people who have heart failure, not specifically muscular dystrophy, that we probably should be using this medication earlier in the management. And this uh, study came out in 2011, which basically suggested that. It suggested starting this medication earlier in the course of heart failure and that there was a big improvement in how people did. And so that's... Um, brought along this, which is a study that was done in the mouse model of Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy, but basically showed that spironolactone, which is, again, just like that aplerinone medicine that's called an aldosterone antagonist, actually showed benefit in the heart of the mouse model. Specifically, this is with dystrophin mutations, um, but also interestingly showed some improvement of diaphragm function. And so now we've started adding this medication much more commonly to a lot of our patients. There are some caveats with using these medicines, spironolactone or a plerinone. I've had um, some elevated potassium levels can develop, so we have to monitor that very carefully. Um, but in general, we are seeing some very nice improved heart function adding this medicine. So this came out um, last year. This is basically the care considerations guidelines that were put out and published for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And I would suggest that one of the things that this group should think about doing is we should get together and modify this and really update this so that we're doing this for Becker muscular dystrophy. But in the meanwhile, we can learn some important things for what's here for Duchenne. And we talked today about cardiac management and the medications and the monitoring that we do for that. So that includes getting EKGs, echocardiograms, Holter monitors, which is where you wear the heart monitor for 24 hours, being on medications like ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, and the other heart failure medications. The other really, really important part of this is the pulmonary management, and we just heard about that from Dr. Wolf because it turns out the heart likes oxygen, and that's what pulmonary management does. It not only gives your heart good oxygen, gives your brain good oxygen, and it keeps you functioning a whole lot better a whole lot longer, and that's the goal. So um, our other cardiac monitoring we talked about, um, most, most patients with Becker muscular dystrophy probably should be getting an echocardiogram every year, should be getting an EKG every year, Holter monitoring once a year, 24-hour monitor to see what the heart is doing. Uh, cardiac MRI should be done because, again, this gives us information about how much scar is present in the heart, and that helps inform who needs to get defibrillators. So these are the things your cardiologist should be providing for you. And if you go to your cardiologist and they don't know what these things are and why you should have this, you should probably find another cardiologist. So what's coming next? 
Um, this was a trial that came out um, in 2011 also. This is a, a viral delivery of a calcium handling protein. This was done in just general heart failure patients, but this also may be available for treatment of heart failure associated with Becker muscular dystrophy, and this is a clinical trial that's being discussed right now. It's being done by a company. Another thing that's coming, coming is a drug called P188, which is a membrane sealant. This has now been tested in the dystrophic dog model and specifically looked at the heart function and showed that you could get some improvement in heart functioning by administering this P188 agent. So those are a couple things to keep an eye on that may be coming down the line. And that just works by stabilizing the plasma membrane, and that's what's shown here. So let's just summarize a little bit. So how do you manage your heart? You want to stay on top of this. You don't want to like learn about it after it's happened. You want to be right up front, being proactive, making sure you're taking care of it. Find a cardiologist you can work with and find a cardiologist that knows something about muscular dystrophy. You need an annual echocardiogram. You should consider having a baseline MRI and that should be done with contrast. You should have a Holter monitor once a year. You should monitor your symptoms. The symptoms to pay attention to are shortness of breath, fatigue, palpitations. If you have fainting or near fainting episodes, that is something to not ignore. You have to pay attention to that and let your cardiologist know about it right away. Medication use, which I'll summarize on the next slide. Devices need to be considered for preventing arrhythmias if that seems like it's a problem. Some devices may be available for actually improving heart function, and those can be defibrillator devices or left ventricular assist devices, which I'll mention in one second. And most importantly, make sure your heart's getting oxygen. That means have a good pulmonologist who understands what it is to take care of patients with neuromuscular disease. So just a very brief summary of the medications I talked about. You want to be on either an ACE inhibitor or the cousin medication, an angiotensin receptor blocker. That's category one. You gotta be on one of those two things. The next thing to be on, and I'll give you some examples of the common ones that are used here in the United States, lisinopril, enalapril, captopril, all the prills, that's the ACE inhibitors. And the ARBs, the angiotensin receptor blockers, are the ones that end in A-N, T-A-N. The beta blockers most commonly, carvedilol and metoprolol, are probably the ones that get used. Bisoprolol now gets used a fair amount. Then we talked about aldosterone antagonists. That's the spironolactone and the aplerinone. And these, I'm seeing some good results with this in the patients that I've been managing, but there are some caveats with it, which is to watch for high potassium, so your blood has to be monitored with that. Water pills get used when you start having problem with water accumulation. So if you're getting swelling in your feet or you're having extra fluid accumulation in your lungs, that's when you need to be on a water pill. For some people, if their heart function's very bad, we talk about actually having to thin their blood a little bit with antiplatelet agents, such as aspirin or clopidogrel, or sometimes we actually use Coumadin, which is actually a, a blood thinner, and there's some newer agents now, like Pradaxa and some others that will do some blood thinning. That's mainly if a clot has already developed in the heart. Digoxin is a very old medicine, helps the heart beat a little stronger, so we do use this sometimes, but we have to watch that, because um, you know, it can have side effects with it. And then I get asked a lot whether you, if you have high cholesterol, can you be on medications like a statin? And this is to prevent blockages in your arteries. You obviously don't want to get blockages in your arteries. You want to keep your heart in as good a shape as possible. And in general, I have found statin use to be very well tolerated in my muscle patients without any problem, different than, no different than what we see in the general population. So devices for the heart, pacemakers what you get when your heart's going too slow. The pacemaker helps it go faster. A biventricular pacemaker is a special device that helps the heart pump a little bit stronger by coordinating the left and the right ventricle. A defibrillator, that's for when the heart goes too fast. It can deliver a shock and reset it into a normal rhythm. There are now devices called subcutaneous defibrillators that just go under the skin, and so those are newer, and there's now, I think, one that has FDA approval. There are external defibrillators. If you don't want to get an internal defibrillator, you know those uh, I, uh, the devices that you see around airports and banks and all sorts of places like that? Get a defibrillator for your house. Make sure that people at home know how to use it, although the instructions with it are very simple, and there's nothing wrong with having a defibrillator in your house. And then the big devices that are coming down the path are what are called left ventricular assist devices. This is actually a heart pump. Um, it's a pump system that sits inside your heart and can help your heart 
work better. This is the device that we use instead of doing a heart transplant on somebody because a heart transplant has its own set of problems associated with it and we have some people just now living with left ventricular assist devices. I know of one Becker patient who's already received a left ventricular assist device and so that's another option if heart function gets really bad. But hopefully the main message here is start early, get your heart treated early and hopefully we can really slow the progression of the heart getting bad or even prevent the heart from getting bad. And so this is just a picture of what a left ventricular assist device looks like. That's a pump that sits outside the heart and then the parts that sit inside the heart. And um, I'm going to stop right there. You heard from Lisa. I'd like to thank her because she does a lot of work. We have uh, great imagers here at the University of Chicago, and I'd like to thank the Muscular Dystrophy Association. So um, I think...